Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Bortz, and I am the resident scholar at Virginia Opera, and I am delighted to be with you this evening for Let's Talk Opera, previewing the third production of Virginia Opera's 23-24 season, Sanctuary Road. I am joining you. You may notice a little different environment this evening. I'm joining you from the offices of Arizona Opera, where I am working on a production of The Barber of Seville, but I can't wait to be back with you in Virginia in just a couple of weeks for this incredibly powerful, monumental, modern masterpiece, Sanctuary Road. Before we begin, a couple ground rules as always. First, those of you who are joining our live stream live on January 16th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Welcome. So delighted to have you here. Make sure you are logged in to Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, wherever it is that you are watching this feed, and you can ask questions. I will see them in real time and respond appropriately. If you are watching this uh, after the fact in a, a recorded link, maybe before a performance of Sanctuary Road, also welcome. Please feel free to add any comments throughout uh, the time that you are watching this video in order for me to respond, in order to get you as prepared as possible for what you're about to experience on stage. Finally, we have a special announcement this evening, which is that the pre-show lectures, which as you may or may not know, take place 45 minutes before each performance of our main stage season. This time, the pre-show lectures will be conducted by scholars uh, who have specialties in the Underground Railroad in the historical context that you will be seeing come alive on stage. So our focus this evening while we are, of course, going to talk about the subject matter of Sanctuary Road, the Underground Railroad, William Still, and many other individuals, our focus is about the music, is about the context of the piece itself, so that our fabulous pre-show scholars can give you all of the insights surrounding the wider context. I'm delighted that we are having these guests and that we are getting this multi-perspective conversation on this incredibly important subject matter. So this evening we're going to focus on the work itself and a little bit to get you started into experiencing Sanctuary Road. Our preview will last approximately one hour. We are live, so we never exactly know, uh, but I can't wait to share with you this fantastic piece. This is uh, a piece that premiered in 2018. It was written in 2017, and it itself is an opera oratorio. And we're going to break down those two words, oratorio and contemporary opera, in just a couple minutes. But before we do, I want to briefly lay out the historical context that this uh, opera oratorio pulls from. Here we have a photo of William Still, who hopefully you've heard of maybe from your high school curriculum, college, your knowledge of uh, the events surrounding the Underground Railroad, but he was one of the most influential and prominent uh, conductors of the Underground Railroad. He helped uh, almost 800 or more uh, freedom seekers during his time working on the Underground Railroad from his home base in Philadelphia. He was born in 1821 uh, as a free man in New Jersey. He was one of 18 children. And what's interesting is he ended up actually helping one of his siblings, his brother, make it to freedom without necessarily realizing it. So even though he was born free, he was very aware, uh, painfully aware, of the legacy of freedom of uh, of slavery that was happening around him, and worked diligently to help those who uh, could make their way north. So he was incredibly prominent, along with the likes of Harriet Tubman and many other people of all racial and religious backgrounds, who were instrumental in creating this network that we call the Underground Railroad, that eventually helped about a hundred thousand people make their way to freedom. Whenever we're talking about the Underground Railroad, we are talking about a very secretive and by design, uh, close-knit community who was able to create this network to move people across uh, time and space as they made their way 
north. Um, so all of our statistics are a little hazy because there are very few documents. There are very few records about this incredibly important moment in American history that really started in the late 1700s, uh, gained its kind of most involved period in the decades leading up to the Civil War, particularly after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So many people are working, helping to bring freedom seekers to freedom. But William Still was not only prominent because of his involvement in helping those freedom seekers, he was also prominent because he recorded their stories. And that is a very important point that I want to make here at the very beginning of our Let's Talk opera, is all of the stories, all of the words you will experience in Sanctuary Road are either directly from Still's writing or are poetic paraphrases of his words. The creators, we'll, we'll talk about a little later, were very intentional about letting the voices of those who went through this experience, either those freedom seekers who told their stories or still writing these stories down and chronicling uh, uh, the effects of slavery on individuals, wanting those voices to come through. So that is a really interesting thing about this libretto that I think we should pay attention to, and is one of the reasons why William Still was chosen for the focus of Sanctuary Road, is we have this document that he wrote that was published in 1872 of all of the records of his takeaways, of his observations, as he interviewed those seeking freedom. So William Still, important in the actual bringing about of the Underground Railroad from his home base in Philadelphia, but also an incredible chronicler of those stories. So let's now, with that overarching context, and we'll come back to a couple of those stories and the structure of the operetta in just a few moments, let's now turn our attention to the operatic side of what you will be experiencing as we talk and uh, break down opera and oratorio. Let's start with the oratorio, which is a fascinating genre of music that is getting more and more play, which is really exciting in our modern music making world. First, some definitions. An oratorio is a large scale musical work, usually on a sacred or semi-sacred theme that is written for soloist, chorus, and orchestra. These are works that are largely not staged. That means they do not rely on sets and costumes. This means that they do not rely on people moving through space. It is the score and it is the text of the oratorio itself that brings the story or the theme to life. Oratorios, the term, comes from the word oratory, which, uh, which is a part of the Roman Catholic Church, and these started in, church, uh, in churches. And the way these would be performed starting in the 1500s, 16th century, is you would have two halves of the musical work, and in between would be a sermon. That's where the sacred context of this work comes from. But very soon, people began to take all of these ideas and build upon them. The Italians, as opera was coming of age, the oratorio and the opera, uh, were birthed at essentially the same time, which I think is interesting. You have the sacred non-staged version, and then you have the staged version of music and drama combining. Composers used many of the same musical resources. You get arias, you get duets, you get ensembles, you get recitative or that talk singing that happens in so much opera. They're using the same musical tools, but for a different purpose. Eventually, the Germans take up the oratorio and it becomes a fantastic way for the depiction uh, for composers to depict things like the passion story. Um, and so you get Bach, for example, writing the St. Matthew's Passion or what have you, telling the story of the last days in Christ's life. Again, there's that sacred theme. Many people are familiar with oratorios around the holidays. Uh, many people may have just seen performances of Handel's Messiah. These are all examples of oratorios, of these operas 
that are definitively not staged. The era of the Baroque from 1600 to 1750 is what many scholars refer to as the golden age of the oratorio, but I would assert for you this evening that we are now in the second great age of the oratorio, and we'll give some examples of those beyond Sanctuary Road in just a couple of moments. The first one of these oratorios that is recorded from around the year 1600 is uh, translating the Italian here, the representation or the embodiment of the body and soul, uh, written by the composer Emilio della Calavigeri, excuse me, uh, in 1600. But as I mentioned, Bach, Charpentier in France, Handel, and so many more would take up sacred themes using the musical resources of opera. So with all of that said about what an oratorio is and some of the key traits of these oratorios, why is an opera company then doing an oratorio? Well, interestingly enough, over the past, it's hard to put an exact year on it, but 50, 60 years or so, companies, producers, directors, conductors, and singers have recognized the inherent dramatic power of the oratorio, of taking a sacred or semi-sacred theme and putting it in the context of dance theater, of opera. And so it has become a tradition to stage these works. This is not something that is necessarily new. This is something that, as I mentioned, has been happening for a long time. And a number of oratorios have, have taken on new life as staged operas. Great examples from Handel come to mind. For example, his oratorio, Semele. We also get the oratorio of Samson or Saul, which have had incredible stagings in the past couple of years. The Metropolitan Opera later this season will be presenting John Adams's El Nino, which is a work that is being staged on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera, but was originally conceived as an oratorio. So you see this lifting up of these works, taking them out of sacred spaces or out of the concert hall where they are usually performed and giving them the dramatic life that their music deserves. Next year, there will be oratorios staged at the Met as well when they announce their season. And my guess is as more and more uh, boundaries are broken down by contemporary opera, the oratorio, the idea of taking a theme that we think of as sacred to us culturally or religiously or beyond and lifting that up through the power of dramatic storytelling is only becoming more and more a part of what we do on the operatic stage. So Sanctuary Road is not the exception anymore that we are taking something that was originally written for the concert hall and bringing it to life on stage. This is something that is uh, a trend in our contemporary operatic music making. Speaking of the opera side of opera oratorio, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about where we are in contemporary opera. While introducing this work, I said that this is a modern masterpiece, and I fully endorse those superlatives. This is a work of fierce drama, of stunningly beautiful music, and is worthy of uh, every consideration on any stage of opera. It also is tapping into a lot of themes that we are seeing in the course of contemporary opera production. You may or may not realize it, but we are in the middle of an operatic renaissance, particularly in the United States. There have been more world premieres in the past couple decades than the previous century at least the, the second half of it. So we are producing more opera than was produced in the decades following the death of Puccini. That is a pretty stunning statistic. And so one of the things that I think is interesting when we look at operas that are written today or opera oratorios that are written today is to take a look at all of them and say, what can we see 
that is being reflected in this art? What are some trends that we're tapping into that artists are interested in and that we as audience members and lovers of this art form or first time viewers of this art form can really dive into and what can we see across all of these diverse works? Well, that leads me to my first big point I wanna make about where we are in contemporary opera. These works are diverse. Here you have a list of just some, just a small percentage of the composers who are writing these modern masterpieces. And if you are to Google each of these names, if you want to take a picture of your screen right now to look up these names later, you have tons of different kinds of people represented. We are more diverse in our music making than we have uh, been in centuries. And I think that is really stunning and really important. Lots of different experiences, lots of different stories, lots of different perspectives, lots of different kinds of music and different kinds of drama are making their way to the operatic stage. And that is only a good thing. Here you have composers who are female, composers who are black, composers who are queer, all kinds of different experiences, a combination of all of the above that are coming together to tell these wonderful stories. So I encourage you, following this presentation or following this viewing of this preview, look up some of these names and see what kinds of sounds they are making. So these composers who are writing today, what are they doing? What are some trends that we can see in contemporary opera? Well, one of the biggest trends, speaking of diversity, is that this style of opera is not ubiquitous. There is not one style of contemporary opera. And that, I think, is noteworthy that we are not writing in one idiom. Different composers are tapping into lots of different styles of writing. And so diversity is a quality of contemporary opera. No one opera or opera oratorio sounds the same. Additionally, we are seeing different kinds of music being accepted in the operatic tradition. Some of the pieces that are written by composers that I put up previously bring in indigenous music, bring in jazz, bring in pop, bring in rock, bring in all kinds of different sounds that then are melded with what we consider to be the Western classical tradition that you might be more familiar with. So diversity is key in these contemporary operas and a diversity of musical expression and style. Very rarely now do you have a contemporary opera that doesn't rely on a different kind of music that it is lifting up and to create its unique sound. Additionally, on the visual and production side, these pieces tend to be more multidisciplinary, multimedia, the way that dance, that theater, that video technology, that projections uh, work together is helping to structure these operas. The moment that we find ourselves with barriers breaking down right and left in order to tell better and different stories is also true in opera. So be on the lookout for how these elements play out in contemporary opera that you experience. We are getting a lot more multicultural expression, which is a part of the different soundscapes that we're hearing, as well as the different composers and librettists whose voices we are, uh, we are seeing come to fruition at the table. A lot of the subject matter that we get in these operas tends to also uh, function as a form of advocacy. Now, I want to be very clear. All opera throughout history has always been a political act. I don't mean partisan. I mean political. Dealing with issues about how we live together how we can better society, where are the cracks in society. This is something that was very important and interesting to people like Mozart, to people like Verdi. La Traviata was a work of political opera. Now, time and space required those composers to present their stories in different ways, but opera has always been political. What is fascinating to me about the works that we're creating today is we are allowed to be much more direct about the stories and this, the people that we are lifting up through our contemporary works. 
Additionally, because American opera companies are almost exclusively not-for-profit organizations, there is a social or civic component that is uh, uh, being more widely explored that is giving birth to a number of different kinds of opera. I think this is a good thing. I think this is a wonderful thing. And I think when we think about composers who are spending years writing these works, we want people to write things that matter. We want people to write things that can get us thinking, which is a different kind of entertainment. And so we are looking for the issues or the ideas that are being explored throughout each opera. And Sanctuary Road is no exception. Finally, what uh, is considered operatic material is radically shifting and changing in wonderfully surprising ways. It is no longer just plays and novels that count as source material, history ripped from the headlines from centuries ago, uh, poems, um, characters that exist in the pop culture or zeitgeist, all kinds of different things, newspapers, all kinds of different subject matter is ripe for operatic adaptation. And so when you put all of these things together, you get some of the threads that exist in contemporary opera and that you'll see come to fruition on the stage as you see Sanctuary Road. That leaves us then with the music. In addition to the multi-sonic uh, uh, presences and soundscapes we get in contemporary opera, one of the things, and arguably one of the most important things I think you can take away from our discussion of contemporary opera, is that these scores are beautiful. Many listeners, particularly who have been around opera for a while, can sometimes be a little nervous of contemporary opera. And they're nervous because of the thorny sounds that were created by composers in earlier decades. We are now kind of past that. The more kind of thorny, academic, intense sounds that were prized by composers around the world wars in the 20th century has shifted. And so many of the contemporary operas that are making headlines today that are being produced year after year since the year 2000 are pieces that are gorgeous. So when you come to Sanctuary Road, you are going to see an experience of diverse storytelling you're going to hear different kinds of music working together to tell the story of the Underground Railroad through the words of Still, uh, William Still, and those that he was interviewing. And you are going to hear music that is intensely beautiful and meaningful. So at this point, I want to take a step back and review what we've talked about so far. We talked a little bit about what Sanctuary Road is. It is an opera oratorio based on the writings and experiences of William Still, one of the great uh, conductors of the Underground Railroad based out of Philadelphia, and also one of its most important chroniclers who actually wrote and gathered interviews from freedom seekers in order to tell their stories. We then talked a little bit about what an oratorio is, those uh, non-staged sacred works that use orchestra, chorus, and soloists. We then talked about opera and where contemporary opera is right now, what are some of the trends that we can follow across these works, how can we join the moment that we are in, and how does that tap in to what has always been happening throughout operatic history, and also took a look briefly at how oratorios have made the, the, the plunge, if you will, into the opera house from just being works on the concert stage. And more and more oratorios are being written with each passing day. And my guess is that more and more of these works will receive their operatic premieres in short order. So with all of that said and out of the way, I want you to now join me as we now talk specifically about Sanctuary Road. I want to talk a little bit about the creators of this work, about its context in which it was premiered, and then we'll dive into the music and we'll listen to some clips and get your ears acquainted with the soundscapes that you will experience when you come and see these works live. Sanctuary Road has a score by Paul Moravec, who uh, 
is an incredibly pop prominent American composer, uh, kind of working right now at the height of his powers. Not only did he write Sanctuary Road, which has been very popular across um, uh, the, the entire operatic and uh, uh, concert world, but he also wrote the operatic adaptation of The Shining, that's right, there's an opera adaptation of that great Stephen King uh, novel and movie, and he wrote the score to it, and that's been selling out in opera houses over the past couple of years. That has led to some prominent Metropolitan Opera commissions and other exciting projects. He won the Pulitzer Prize for Music in 2004 and is just one of the musical voices that we should be paying attention to uh, here in America, along with the likes of Damien Jeter, who's writing our uh, uh, world premiere of Loving versus Virginia set for next season at Virginia Opera. Lots of composers doing fascinating things. Paul Moravec is one of them. He met the librettist for Sanctuary Road, Mark Campbell, while writing The Shining. And so their next project, after writing that intense theatrical opera, was to turn their attention to the Underground Railroad and wanting to explore that. They decided to set the works of William Still because they wanted the words and the uh, emotions and the perspective of what was being presented to come from the writings of those who lived through it. There is nothing fictional about this per se. This is not uh, creating narratives out of um, scant um, documentation. This is literally taking those works and lifting it up. They also chose to write an oratorio, and this is, I think, the power of the oratorio and of combining that with opera. With the word oratorio comes a weight to it. These are all sacred or semi-sacred themes. Requiems are oratorios. Masses are oratorios. Stories that have been around for thousands of years are oratorios. And so by choosing to take still, to take the stories of the freedom seekers from the Underground Railroad and to lift those up as uh, words as important, if not more so, than many of the uh, themes and words and stories that have been depicted in sacred music throughout the Western musical tradition, I think gives this work power. The word oratorio is not thrown around lightly here, and there is a sacred quality to what is being presented on stage. Coincidentally, there are also elements from the Psalms and from scripture that are woven throughout as appropriate that give this work the emotional and thematic weight that it has. It was Mark Campbell's idea to, uh, to set the, um, the, word, uh, or the, the words of still, and it was actually Mark Campbell who came up with the title Sanctuary Road, and the implication being that we are still on that road towards freedom for all people, that this is an active discussion, just as the Underground Railroad was an interracial collaboration to help freedom seekers. So this project is meant to bring different people together to use these words, to use this moment in time from the 19th century to discuss the similar uh, uh, issues that we might be facing today. This work then premiered in 2018 at Carnegie Hall in its concert format, and then in 2022, the work was adapted for its operatic premiere at North Carolina Opera. So to my knowledge, this is, you know, the third or fourth staged version of Sanctuary Road. And again, my guess is this is going to uh, only continue as this work continues to gain in popularity. So adding costumes, adding staging, adding projections and things like that is what brings it the, uh, the kind of grandeur of opera, combining the best of sacred oratorios with the best of our operatic expression. It's worth noting, by the way, that this picture that you're looking at here in the slide is the opening uh, page of that copy, that um, first printing from 1872 of Still's work, the Underground Railroad Records, which you will hear literally and paraphrased throughout the uh, throughout the work. So 
let's now dive into the structure of this piece and how it has uh, played out uh, or will play out, excuse me, as you are experiencing this uh, either in Norfolk, Richmond, or Northern Virginia. But before we do, I see a question has come in. Were there any concerns about presenting, uh, uh, I assume, this piece or presenting this opera? Um, anytime we do an opera, there are always concerns. Um, when we are an opera company, we have four operas. So what stories are we going to tell? What people are we going to lift up? What perspective of the human condition are we going to explore? And so we always have concerns about which uh, pieces are we going to, uh, to, to select for you to experience. Um, but once Sanctuary Road came to the attention of Peggy uh, Crea Miller, our general director and CEO, and Adam Turner, our artistic director, uh, to my knowledge, there was kind of no question. This was a story that we had to tell. This is, as you'll see in the libretto, this is a Virginia story. Uh, Virginia was absolutely part of the Underground Railroad. There are sites that we are connecting with um, throughout this process in Norfolk and beyond that were a part of the Underground Railroad. You'll hear references to Richmond and Caroline County in uh, the work itself. So this is a story that we need to present. This is a story that we need to lift up. And that is something that Virginia Opera takes seriously, um, as also is evidenced leading towards next year's world premiere of Loving versus Virginia. So this is uh, something that we are uh, once it came to the attention and kind of made sense within the season was something that we became very passionate about moving forward. It's also worth noting that this project is in collaboration with the Virginia Symphony Orchestra. So we are also building our partnerships uh, and joining uh, with lots of different community groups as well as we all are on this road. And that is what Mark Campbell and Paul Moravec are interested in, is taking the history and bringing that forward uh, for audiences to experience in real time in 2024. So the music, the structure, the cast, how does this thing work? And if you're experiencing it for the first time, how can you uh, go about um, uh, listening in the best way possible? First, this is a little different kind of cast than most operas. This work is written for a large chorus, and the chorus in many ways is kind of the protagonist. Um, when you think of most operas, you have a chorus, but their involvement tends to be relatively limited or very just kind of siloed. You know, you'll have a whole chorus scene that will go on in, let's say, La Traviata for 20 minutes, and then the chorus goes away for an hour before they come back. The chorus is omnipresent in this work, and they're constantly underscoring the emotions and the music of the soloists. There are many moments where our chorus gets to shine in wonderful ways. So be on the lookout for the use of the chorus, because they will be utilized more than you've experienced in most operatic productions. Secondly, uh, you'll notice that it is scored for five uh, soloists. And those five soloists play a variety of roles. They don't just play one. They play many different people uh, whose stories are explored through this oratorio. You get the story of uh, a young woman who is escaping on a train. And she is disguised. Actually, she had lighter skin, so she was able to disguise as a white man. And the man she would go on to marry was uh, disguised as essentially her valet in the car at the back of the train. And we get her story and her urgency and her fear of being discovered, and of being caught. We get lots of different stories. One gentleman who um, had himself nailed into a, a shipping container, essentially, and across more than 24 hours was forced to stay in that position. You get the soloist embodying all of these different stories. And so that leads me to our next point of these five soloists and the chorus give us a cascade of stories. Unlike most operas where you get kind of one story that you're following or at least a series of distinct scenes, in Sanctuary Road you get all of the voices happening at once. And there's kind of this musical theme that recurs throughout the 
opera oratorio of the names of the individuals that still was helping and whose stories we will be exploring. And there is this cascade, this kind of mantra that we get as all of these voices overlap, as we hear different aspects of their experience. And to me, it sounds like a waterfall. And water is a major theme throughout this work. There's a stunning aria for the soprano called Rain, for example, that the chorus then joins in on. And that idea of water being both a cataclysm of something uh, traumatic that can happen, but also be a, a, a cleansing balm on the world, and also connecting to the sacred themes of water that exists so prominently in the scripture that is referred to throughout this work. Uh, I think it's interesting to pay attention, and then the opening moments of this oratorio, we get this cascading waterfall motif as we hear the mantra of the names of the individuals whose stories we are about to experience. Let's now hear that in context, since this is one of the important musical ideas that's going to reoccur again and again. Here is the very beginning of Sanctuary Road. Underground Railroad. A record of facts. Authentic narrative. And so that musical idea that what we call in music and especially coming out of the Renaissance tradition of the oratorio, that imitative pattern is something you're going to hear again and again as all of the voices are being uh, uh, put together in this polyphonic context. So that's one of the things that I think is really cool about the score, and it happens at the first moment and will continue on through. Right where we stopped, we then got the voice of William Still himself, who starts speaking and then becomes a sung character uh, through and sung presence throughout the entire work. Um, we're going to talk more about the cast uh, towards the end of our hour, but I am so excited to say that our William Still is Damien Jeter, the composer, performer, multidisciplinary uh, artist um, of, who's writing Loving versus Virginia, set, as I said, for premiere next year. Uh, he's playing our William Still, so this is seeing another side of his artistry in this uh, performance. The piece then goes through a series of numbers um, uh, that you get arias, you get duets, you get some larger ensembles that are peppered throughout with larger choral excerpts. And each of these scenes tells just the snapshot of one of these freedom seekers whose names have become that mantra from the beginning of the piece. Uh, and so you'll learn, I don't want to give too many of them away, but you'll learn these stories, and it's worth noting that all of them are based on the true records of William Still, published in 1872. Throughout these larger numbers, whether they're arias, duets, what have you, we then get these sections that are called in the score interviews, and we hear William Still talk directly to the soloists as each of their respective characters. And so you get this use of recitative or that kind of more talk singing throughout in and amongst these larger musical forces, creating a lot of contrast. For being a work that is only about 90 minutes long all told, there is incredible musical diversity and pacing throughout this. I think it's very well paced. Um, and gives you a lot of different operatic textures throughout. So here is what one of these interview sections sounds like as William Still is chronicling the story of the person in front of him. What do you mean by being treated badly? So three times. What 
What was the name of your master? Flaming lips. Where did he live? Caroline County. So you see this very stark musical context uh, where we have just two people on stage talking. And that provides the intimacy of what it must have been to be in those interviews as still was capturing the, um, uh, the stories of the freedom seekers in front of him, but also allows us to kind of almost like a camera zoom in on one or two humans before pulling the camera out to this kaleidoscopic polyphonic use of the chorus and the soloist at large. Speaking of the chorus, here's a great example of the, the kind of thrilling choral quality that you get in this work that can sometimes be supporting the freedom seekers or sometimes be the antagonist of the freedom seekers. Here we have number three, Reward, where the chorus very aggressively uh, depicts the kinds of words and situations that would be on the reward posters that would be peppered throughout uh, not only the American South, but the entire United States, and gives you a sense of the force and the, uh, the, the kind of uphill battle that many of these freedom seekers faced as they began to engage with those participating in the Underground Railroad. So very different from those recitative uh, sections that we were talking about that are the interval uh, interviews with Still and the individuals. We get these wider, almost cinematic pans, which allows the chorus to, uh, uh, to bring about that emotional story. You know, one of the things that I think we need to consider when we look at contemporary works is why is this an oratorio or why is this an opera? Why is it not a series on Netflix? Why is it not a documentary? And I think the chorus is a big part of this. It is hearing voices sing together, breathe together, um, and allows us a much more kind of abstract palette that you get in this more kaleidoscopic form of art than some of the more um, narrative focuses that we get throughout um, other um, uh, works of art that are, that are prominent right now. So we have recitative, we have these large ensembles. Let's now take a look at some arias. Here we have the uh, aria that then turns into an ensemble, Rain, that is filled with just lush, beautiful, what we call neo-romantic writing that just allows you to sit there and take in the emotion and hear the story unfolding.
know, this is music that singers love to sing <laughs> that has thrilling uh, melodies that just the notes all connect that we get the high notes and it's all very healthy singing. You know, that's what we talk about when we say this neo-romantic, beautiful sound that is found in many, if not most contemporary operas. So we have these cascading water motifs that are the kind of kaleidoscope uh, the polyphony that exists in this world as still is um, bringing these stories to life through his through his records and through his words. We have these intimate recitative interviews. We have these large choral ensembles. And then we have these arias and duets that tell the individual stories of the names who we've experienced. That's kind of a lot for what is ultimately a relatively uh, compact musical and dramatic work. And... Uh, the chorus, as I mentioned, and the orchestra, therefore, are supporting all of this. They are sometimes the protagonist. They are sometimes um, the antagonist. They are sometimes the sounds of the context happening around uh, the individuals on stage. You'll find a moment uh, later, uh, about three quarters of the way through the show, where they will depict the American Civil War through orchestral sounds, which is, again, one of these great things that opera can do, is not just create kind of historical records of what things sound like, but create what the weight of that felt like, the soundscape, the emotional core of what is happening in and around the narrative. It is what creates, I think, the space for emotions in conversations to live in really interesting ways. So those are some of the things to be on the lookout for uh, in the score of this work. Finally, I want to end with a little bit about this particular production, then I'll answer, I see another question has come in, and uh, turn our attention to the finale of the show as all of these threads come together uh, moving forward. This production is led by conductor Everett McCorvey, who we are uh, thrilled to, to bring to Virginia Opera. Um, he's conducted this piece before and is an incredible, incredible advocate of American music uh, and is a true kind of um, icon and leader uh, in especially kind of uh, uh, um, American opera, oratorio and concert work. Our stage director is Camille Howard, who comes to us from having worked on many productions of the Metropolitan Opera. And uh, we're excited for her to be making her debut as well. And the two of them will be shaping the music, dramatic, and visual world that you'll be experiencing. Speaking of that, here are our five soloists. We, of course, have Damian Jeter playing William Still. It's worth noting that Lakita Mitchell, our soprano soloist, premiered this work. So the recording that we've been listening to uh, features her voice. So we are seeing uh, someone who, who originated a role coming uh, to Virginia Opera presenting this to us. It's, it's, it's so thrilling that we can do that with contemporary works. You know, we can't hear the first Violetta in La Traviata, but we can hear the people who premiered these contemporary roles, whose voices shaped the way that the music was written. And that's another aspect of this that I think is so thrilling as we think about opera being an alive, living, breathing art form in our contemporary moment, uh, along with our, uh, our, our vast chorus that you will see here. So when you go, you'll experience large choral forces and incredible orchestration, beautiful music pulling from various traditions. You'll hear a somewhat abstract story that weaves together various accounts of freedom seekers, all tied together through the central figure of William Still, who is interviewing, chronicling, and participating throughout the entire work based on all of the historical facts that we have talked about this evening and will especially be talking about as we move into uh, pre-show lectures and events surrounding Sanctuary Road. That leads us to a question that came in uh, just a couple of minutes ago. So what aspect of the presentation demands our attention, the art or the documentation of the actual events? The answer to that question is both. The wonderful thing about opera, the wonderful thing about art, is it can do multiple things at once. And 
deals with things like historical realities of history through music, through something that actually exists because it can't be written down in words. <laughs> that we can take text that was written and published in 1872 based on an actual historical event and we can give it literal breath. <laughs> we can give it literal melody and is maybe a different way in than just reading a textbook or just reading Still's uh, work, which I encourage us all to do. But it's a different experience to be sitting in a theater with people in 2024 hearing these words. Anytime we experience a work of art, I think when it works well, it's leading to conversation, not just conversation through events that the company is putting on, but also the conversation happening in the lobby, the conversation that happens after the fact. My guess is many people who will be experiencing Sanctuary Road um, don't know that much about William Still and the various freedom seekers who are depicted throughout. So there is a, an educational component. There's an entertainment component. There's a civic component. All of these things work together. And the great thing about opera is it brings all of that together into one. It is not either or. We aren't supposed to turn our attention to just one part of a performance or another. We are supposed to participate in this coming together in an overwhelming way all of the different facets of operatic production and everything that goes into creating a work such as Sanctuary Road. Um, looking in the chat for any other, I hope that answered that question. <laughs> I, I believe that in my core uh, as one of the reasons why we, why we do and we produce what we do. Seeing no other questions, I want to now turn our attention to the final music clip that I have for us, and that is the finale. In this finale, Still has found his records, which survived uh, the American Civil War, and he reads the letters of those who he helped. And you get all of the uh, stories of the successes of those who found freedom in Canada, Philadelphia, uh, what have you, and you get what happens next. At that point, still joins with the entire chorus into something that is more broad, something that is uh, a, an ode to freedom, which might sound kind of trite or might sound kind of cliched, but the great thing about an oratorio and an opera is that this is the most sincere form of art, that you have people singing these phrases, these words, and forces us to confront uh, music, not with archness, not with irony, but with sincerity, with a heartbeat and with breath. And I think it is a wonderful way to wrap up our discussion of Sanctuary Road and to preview what it is that you'll possibly be experiencing when you come to the Opera House. Within that cascading idea of overlapping narratives that we get in opera. Can't do that movie as easily.
And so what started out as these cascading different perspectives comes together. And that's just something that music does so brilliantly is weave multiple things that would just be noise into literal harmony. And we get that here in the stunning emotional conclusion of Sanctuary Road. Um, it has been a delight previewing this with you all this evening. Again, thank you for attending if you're attending this live or if you are watching this after the fact in a recorded uh, fashion. Remember to uh, ask questions as you see fit. I, I will be monitoring those moving forward. I want to also mention before we wrap up this preview that thanks to support from, the, uh, from Dominion Energy that this uh, opera oratorio is a pay what you can uh, performance for Norfolk and for Richmond. So uh, we hope that there are uh, no, if uh, if any, barriers for you being able to attend, to hear this music, to learn these stories, to be a part of the conversation, which are the three aspects of what uh, opera, and in particular contemporary opera, does best. Please uh, join the conversation. Check out vaopera.org for all the various events surrounding this, performances of Cotton as part of our uh, uh, Pride and Black Voices uh, project, pre-show lectures with incredible scholars from each of our markets uh, surrounding the historical context of the Underground Railroad, and I can't wait to experience this masterpiece of American opera oratorio repertoire with you starting at the end of the month and continuing through February in Norfolk, Richmond, and George Mason University in Fairfax. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you all at the opera. <laughs>